Tonight is pitch decks, okay? In preparation, probably too late for Saturday. But um, we're so glad that you're going to be pitching on Saturday. Please sign up if you haven't. And you shouldn't think of it as pitching so much as telling your story about your business and why you started it. Um, it's really the first step to pitching. There, there's a certain formula I'm going to go over for when you're pitching to investors. But you just have to get comfortable with the notion that you want to talk about your business in a way that investors or customers will understand. And hi, David. And I suppose I should be putting in the sign-in thing, which I haven't looked for. And so um, I'm Maggie. You've seen me before. I talked about Tam Sam Som. And Tam Sam Som, if you recall, is probably the slide in your pitch deck that takes the most time to create. Because it's not just doing research on your market, but it's also doing a projection of your sales for this time bound period that you're going to specify and select. So it's either five years, maybe three years, maybe seven years. The longer time frames have to do with the time it's going to take you to actually get to market. So seven years is going to be more like a pharmaceutical, which takes even longer than seven years a lot of the time. So, so three to five years is a pretty good amount of time to do a projection. All right, so I'm going to start sharing now if everybody is cool with that. So we're going to go into my startup deck. Oh, okay. Tell me what people, that's what they're seeing? Yep. Oh, okay. that's nice. I'm actually getting to see the next slide as well. All right, can everybody hear me okay? Oh, Only yeah, you can, can answer. actually see the next slide as well. Oh, you're seeing that? Oh, bizarro. Uh, let's see, display settings. Let us go to, how, how is that appearing? <laughs> how is it appearing on your thing? Oh, we're good. We're good. Okay, so only the people in the room get to see the next slide. Okay. <laughs> okay. One or the other of you is going to be seeing the next slide. Uh, but there's no speaker notes, so you just have to listen anyway. So this is Pitch Decks 101. And the basics of the information are, this is for a live presentation. You should have a library of Pitch Decks for different situations. But a live pitch means that you want the focus to be on you. Michelle heard this the other day. You want the focus to be on you. So the slides need to be pretty simple. They need to have one idea per slide. If they have writing on them, there has to be minimal writing and it has to be very large. So you want to be able to have the people in the back of the room be able to see the slide without too much effort. When you're in person, your enthusiasm for your company will come across in your voice and your mannerisms. So you want the slides to not detract from you. You don't want the audience to be focusing on slides. You want the audience to be focusing on you. So you're going to use maybe one image and just large bullet points to emphasize the story that you're telling. And when you go into a live pitch, you need to know your audience. You need to know if you're pitching to investors, what companies have they invested in before you? Or is it practice? Because they don't actually invest in your type of company, but you've gotten the pitch meeting, which is great because you can use that in the future to say, hey, I pitched to this group, but they don't invest in my industry. But I got the pitch. But if they are somebody that invests in your industry, you want to be really careful about how you craft your deck and you don't want to make it too fancy because when you're pitching to investors who invest in your industry, you don't want anything to go wrong. And so you, you want to make it very minimal. So the style means just one idea per slide with the large font and few words. And these are the slides that should be in your deck. You guys can see them okay? So we're always going to start, actually we don't always have to start with the problem and pain point, but they are some of the first things that frame the pitch 
or the story that you're telling. And you can start with a personal experience. Did you ever notice that this happened? And I found it really annoying. And so I came up with this idea for this company. In some cases, if you have a strong team and the team has had exits, then you can start, hey, this is so-and-so and me. And we were part of this company and part of this company. We've had great exits. Your money is safe with us. Or you may start with, I just want to frame this investor uh, pitch. This is how much we're looking for. These are our terms. And now let me tell you about what we're doing. Okay, so these, these three different ones can be your first slide. Problem, solution, or team, or investor amount. Those are your three possible first slides. If you're just starting out, you haven't received investment before, or you haven't had an exit before, then you want to probably just start with the problem and solution. But the problem can definitely be a story that you tell about how you got into this business. Okay, so then we're going to cover the market opportunity, and that's your Tam Sam Sam slide. Uh, the business model, which is how you make money, who you're selling to and competition. Competition usually follows closely upon market opportunity. Could be after business model. Traction. Now traction is sales. In my book, traction is just sales. If you don't have sales, you have milestones or you have progress to date. But don't try fooling anybody and calling that traction. Okay, and then the team, if you haven't started with the team, the team will be at the end. And then the ask. And have loud and clear. Thank you very much. I am going to post that old um, sign-in sheet one more time. All right, moving on. We're going to deal with each one of these slides and some examples for each of them. The problem. You're only going to spend about one minute on this. If it's really technical, you might spend a little bit more, but if it's really technical, you should be speaking to technical people who will understand your problem pretty easily. So the less time you spend on the problem, the more time God bless you, the more time you have to spend on the other topics that you want to talk about. You can use pictures as a demonstration. And pictures can, you know, it's worth a thousand words. So here is an example that is not great. Uh, so this was created by a scientist and he, for some reason, I probably changed the font. You can see that the title slide is a comic sans, which you know is comic strip writing, um, which I detest. So I probably changed it to Arial so that everybody could read it. That being the thing that you want to do is make it so that people can easily perceive what you have on your slide. And so I probably changed it to Arial or the other one that's really easy to read. But this is a very complicated problem slide. You have to read it to understand it. What you want to do with a problem slide is identify a problem that people can easily relate to and they can say, yeah, that's a problem. I've experienced that problem. So as soon as you get that out of the way, that's why you don't have to spend too much time on it, because it should be an easily perceivable problem. Um, I am going to remake this slide. I don't know how many of you had time to read it, but here is the remake of this slide. One in two people will get cancer. Wouldn't you like to know what kind in advance so that you can be watching for it? So it was a very scientific company that did these assays that tested your various cells and RNA and DNA to find where you had markers for cancer. I, I love this slide. So this guy had a very interesting product, but um, overheating is a real problem, right? I love this slide because he's talking about the male nether regions and how they can easily be overheated. So he's showing a car engine overheating and he's, grabbing his package. So it's, it's easily perceivable. So his product was like uh, one of those donut seats that actually had cooling attached to it. 
So, um, and then it went downhill from there. But this was a great problem slide. <laughs> then the solution. You can spend up to two minutes on the solution, but what we find, having received quite a lot of decks, is that the scientists tend to be very interested in the solution, and they'll spend, in a 10 minute pitch, they'll spend three or four minutes talking about their solution, which is a mistake. You need to get onto the things that investors are interested in. So you can use pictures. Uh, remember I said earlier, if you know who your audience is and you're talking to the investors that invest in your field and you put a video in, this is the time it's going to fail. So you don't want to put video into it until we get so that all the platforms, Teams, Google, Zoom, all of them work really well with video. Don't risk it. Okay? Don't demo with a phone. Don't include screenshots. Screenshots in a live presentation, like you can see the next slide coming up, it's really hard to see because the text is super tiny. I've had people send me slides with three different screenshots in them. You can't perceive any of them. So you should be telling us in the solution why you're 10 times better than whatever's out there right now. So here is a poor example, and I just can't, I can't fix this. So once again, we have Comic Sans, but this was something where they were dealing with children, so I can almost forgive that. And then they have a screenshot with text that you have to, I'm 12 inches away, I can read the text. Can anyone in this room read that text? No, they can't. Let me just tell you, they can't. Um, so there's too many there's too much text on it the narration this could all be narration when you're in a live pitch situation your script is more important than what is on the screen it should enhance and explain what's on the screen but what's on the screen should only emphasize the points that you want the listener to take away and here is a better example so this is a lot of images, but this is the all-day adventure flask. This is a company that Fund Envy has invested in. It's a consumer good, which we normally don't invest in. Um, but he was a local kid made good, so uh, we liked his product. And this slide shows everything that it can do. Now, the Tahoe based and built to travel. All the text under there really doesn't need to be there. He should be narrating what it says and saying how he decided that he needed to create this product. He and his wife travel a lot. They camp a lot. And they go to kind of exotic destinations like Machu Picchu and the Himalayas, okay, where it's very difficult for them to get their coffee. And they miss their pour over coffee. So this was the main inspiration. But they also wanted to be able to make cocktails in it and not have it taste like coffee. So they have this thermal core. So if you keep that in your freezer, it's going to keep whatever you have there cool. They've got the filter because a lot of times they were in places where the water was not reliable. So I thought this was a really nice slide. And now we're going to move on to market. Now we've already done the Tam Sam Sam slide. So you can spend one minute on this. But you know that as you're talking to investors, they are going to probe into Tam Sam Sam. So you need to have developed it so that it shows really well on the slide, but you can back it up with explaining how you got to Tam Sam Sam. So Tam and Sam, total addressable market and service available market, they need to be researched and they need to be expressed in dollars. And then your SOM is your projection, that three to five years, whatever you decide on. So we want to only hear about your major market, but if you have a plan for a secondary or tertiary market, you can mention that in your narration. But you want them to focus on your first market. So here's a really messy slide. 
the market. This is probably formatting problem on my side, but this is what the slide looked like. There was just a lot of stuff going on, and the number that I'm drawn to is 52%. So 52% of something are going to need long-term care. So of course I remade the slide, and it says 10,000 baby boomers are turning 65, 52% are going to need long-term care, and so the beds that are projected to be needed in 2020 are 2.7 million, and this was this pitch was done in 2020, and so in 10 years it's going to almost double. So this is a growing market, and that's what this needed to show. Um, here's another one that, well, yesterday it looked better. <laughs> the achievable was all in one place. Um, this was a company that was working on construction software. Um, a lot of the construction trade has not really been modernized much. They're still doing a lot of things on paper and on Excel instead of having a software solution that helps them to do these things to coordinate purchasing parts, getting them to the required site at the right time. And that's what this software was doing. So they were focusing on contractors, but they were looking for large contractors, and there were 15.5 thousand of them, 15 and a half thousand. And there are 150,000 contractors with 20 plus employees. So these are the two markets that they were focused on. And in our TAM, SAM, SAM, Venn diagram, they're talking about what the, they think the market is worth versus on the left side, they're talking about the number of companies that they can talk to. All right, business model. So for us at Startup NV and Fund NV, if you haven't done market research that looks good, looks like you spent time doing it, and you haven't done a business model, no, we lost Mike, but he's back. Um, if you don't have those two things pretty well dialed in, we're gonna reject your deck flat out and tell you you have to work on these two areas. So to me, to Startup NV, these are the two most important areas, understanding your market and then telling us about your business model. Who are you selling to? What are you charging? How are you reaching them? That's your business model. We get a lot of slides in that say, oh, we're going to use social media, we're going to have influencers use our product, but they don't tell us what they're charging, and they don't tell us what their product costs. If it's a software product, that's really variable, but if you're selling a packaged good, a real product that you have to build, you can tell us what it costs you to make it, and what you think you're going to open your retailing with, selling it, at that price. That is still adjustable too, just like a software price is, but we need to know what it's costing you right now, and if you're starting out and you don't have scale, and so you have to buy fewer units that cost more, you should understand, okay, if I can get to where I'm buying 10,000 units at a time, or 100,000 units at a time, how it's gonna bring your cost of goods sold down, and how it's gonna increase your margin for what you're selling it for. So you can spend one to one and a half minutes on this. These time, we lost David too. These, uh, these time suggestions kind of give you the importance of the various slides that you have here. All right, so here is an example. This is an example of a fellow who had a software company who wanted to be able to track people that were going to conventions. And so this was his business model slide. And he said that his customers were gonna be the convention space owner, the organizers, the vendors, and then the attendees. Okay, so that's everybody involved with a convention. But who is he selling it to? He's not selling it to all of those people. He's selling it to two max, usually. All right, and then he says two revenue streams, a portion of ticket sales. So whatever service he's providing, he's expecting to get a percentage of a ticket sale. And then he's also targeting advertising, which actually has nothing to do with any of these four groups that he has named. Advertising, affiliate advertising is completely different. 
So this was not a great slide. It had no pricing, nothing of real value here. And then this is just a nightmare of a slide. I can't even tell you what it says. We're going to provide an option of posting an ad for 49 cents. Woo! Who don't? Anyway, this is a nightmare. I don't think I could even remake this slide and have it make sense. So there's just too much information on here. It looks like there's competition information here too. It, it, it's just a mess. Don't do this. Here is a better example. So this was a software app and they had two different customers, individuals and businesses. Now, this raises a little bit of a red flag. So we've got individuals at $19 a year. That seems really reasonable. I don't remember what the software was. But we go over to this other business side, and the range in prices from $29 a year to a million dollars a year, that definitely deserves more explanation. That is a huge difference for a business. And if you're going to a million dollars a year, for an enterprise solution, it takes a whole different skill set to sell to enterprise than it does to sell to small and medium-sized businesses. They're just two completely different animals. So this was clean and easy to understand, except for the huge question about $29 a year versus a million dollars a year. And here's one that's pretty simple. This fella, um, this is from several years ago, and he had developed a bench that had a solid bottom so that you could send a code to a UPS delivery guy or a FedEx delivery guy, and he could lift up the bench part and put your packages inside. And so he had three different sizes that he could do. He has his wholesale price here. He has his retail price on the right side. And so you could figure out what was going on with him. Although it looks like my columns are a little out of whack. But the cost of manufacture was $180 for the small one, which he was retailing for $379. So that's great. $300 versus $779. Also good. So if the formatting were fixed, which I think is me and not him, uh, it would be really easy to understand. Competition. Don't say there is not. There is always competition, even if it is just status quo. It takes a lot to get people to stop doing what they're currently doing and do something different. You have to make sure that it's easier for them to do it. And they're going to see some sort of time saving or money saving to do it. Otherwise, they'll just keep doing what they've been doing. So you should be thorough in your research of the competition. And again, Patrick Griffith, the fellow who came here and helped us, um, you're not seeing that, um, he can help you with the competition research too from the, the library. Um, the easiest way to depict competition is with a rack up, which is a, like a matrix. So you put your company up there and then you make a table and you show the competition and your features are listed, all the good things you do and then you compare them to your competitors. So we'll see some examples right here. Um, you can spend only a minute on this. If you're including pricing, make sure you check it every time you pitch, because it changes. So you have to check your competition pricing. Um, so here's a bad example. <laughs> Who is our competition? Professional sports league. Yeah, like the NBA and the NHL, things that you are easily going to recognize. And then who else? The college sports team. This was a company that wanted to create a whole new league of samurai wrestlers. So this is not quite adequate information for that. On the other hand, this is the same company that had the exploded all-day adventure flask. He did a nice job of featuring his features over here on the left side. He named several of easily recognizable competitors, and he put, it's kind of a subtle thing, but his yes things are darker and larger than the no things for the others. So your eyes are drawn to all the great things that he does, and you can see he's got all four of the easy to clean, versatile, rugged, and the vacuum insulation. 
The only advice I would give to him is versatile, the third one down, white on yellow is not high enough contrast. And so he should pick a different color for that or make that one black text, which probably would go against his thing. But he is doing pricing in here, so he needs to be checking the pricing every time he pitches this. And his was the most expensive, right? Um, Yeti's are, yes, yeah, his is more expensive. I think his price has come down a little bit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but back when this was made, um, yeah, most expensive. Here's another nice rack up. This is a company, it's interesting, that this company is one we didn't invest in because we didn't see that the market was big enough to scale. We thought that the market was very high end and very small, that the number of customers that he could gain and the way that he was planning to build them, he would not be able to scale. And so he came to realize that too, but he decided that he wanted to go into business. And so um, he won a competition at UNR as a student, he and his partner. And so what they were doing was taking a Tacoma and so you had to buy the Tacoma, but in addition to that, they were building, custom building, this camper that was solar powered, and it was built to marine spar sort of uh, standards. So everything was not going to break. It was not cheaply made. It was completely watertight. And they were selling it for this price versus the Earth Roamer. Another one of their advantages was that being built on a Tacoma um, wheelbase made that the, the truck was not so high that they couldn't go to a lot of places. So it was very versatile in its size to go deeper into the wilderness areas. And so this has a nice um, example of all of those different vehicles, the pricing for those vehicles, and then what he did. Again, the green check mark is much larger than the little red X. And the little red X's are almost monotonous. And so it's very easy to perceive the things that he's doing better than the others. He's still in business. He's changed the name. I can't remember what it's called. But it's a little bit more like outdoor adventure rather than stern, which has no relationship. All right, traction is sales. For me, traction is sales. It is not milestones. It's not progress. Traction is revenue. So if you have something other than revenue, call it that. Call it progress to date or milestones. So if you have a patent, that's good. People should know that. Um, but that's still not traction. It's just progress. So you only spend a, a minute on this because if you do have sales, the investors are going to be interested. And so they will ask you questions about this. Um, so if you have it, you can show growth month over year or year over year, depending on how long you've been in business. And if you know about the cost to acquire a customer, CAC, you should include that. And if you know the lifetime value of a customer, you can include that too. So as you start with sales, you will know what the cost to acquire the customer is. And it is likely to be higher in the beginning than it will be after you gain traction. Um, and you're only really guessing at the lifetime value. So you need churn, you need to lose customers over time to understand what the lifetime value of a customer is. So you can, you can predict it, you can estimate it, and it's going to change over time. So that is, again, another thing that you need to keep updated as you're pitching your company. Can you, can you do estimate? Like yeah. on CAC, what you're estimating it to be? If you haven't made sales? Well, if you haven't made sales, then there's no point in even trying to do that. How are you going to figure out what it's going to cost you? Are you planning to advertise and then you're just guessing at how many customers you're going to get? Well, I'm hoping that, hoping that it <laughs> won't go above what a percentage of my profit right isn't that oh yeah we're all hoping that. yeah but you should you shouldn't even include that because you don't have sales yet nobody's going to ask you for cac if you don't have sales okay, okay. thank you lawrence yeah so uh, my time uh, 
uh, is in terms of views or how do you? Uh, how will you determine that? Okay, so Lawrence asked about lifetime value. And so that is how long do you hold the customer and what do they spend during the time that they're a customer for you? So Lawrence has a food product and it may be something that is expensive enough that they only order it three times a year at holidays and birthdays. But they could be ordering for years and years, right? They could be ordering for five or seven years. You won't know that until you have churn, until you know that you had a customer for this much time and then they stopped ordering. Okay, so then you'll be able to figure out what the lifetime value is. And it's not going to be the same for every customer. So you're taking averages. So you have somebody who's going to order consistently for seven years. You have somebody who's going to try it for two years and then feel guilty about all the cheesecake they're eating and they're going to cancel their subscription. <laughs> so it's an average of those things. More questions? All right, so here's an example of a very good slide. So she has sales and she has strong retention. So she doesn't have a lot of churn. She has customers that are sticking with her for a long time. So she served 1,900 customers in the past year. So that's respectable. And then 80% of them are making a second purchase within three months. So that's good. She didn't actually show, I don't think she showed churn in here. So this was a gal who was doing subscription underwear, not bras, just underwear. And she found a niche in that larger size women do not have sexy options for their underwear. And so she divined, it's funny because she weighs like 100 pounds herself, but she, did, did, well, she figured out that the larger size women would spend money on sexy underwear. And so she actually started making it herself. At first, when she started her business, she was finding different brands and sending them out in subscriptions every, like once every three months or once a month, whatever people wanted. Um, and then she found that the larger size women would, they would try a size and it wouldn't fit and they would say, I need a larger size. So she started actually manufacturing it. And so that's where she found her real niche. That's where she found product market fit. On your team, a max of four people on your team. There's probably not four people that are equally running the business. Don't be afraid to show yourself as a single founder if that's the case. If you have only one founder, you probably want to include a couple of advisors. But I have seen decks where the advisors that are added on were just people that the founder met along the way and asked if she could call them again and ask for advice. And they said yes. So suddenly they were her advisors, but they didn't have an ongoing relationship with her. They were not watching out for her. They were not keeping tabs on how she, the progress she was making. So it's kind of a fake out. Um, there are a lot of founders who can actually make it on their own without a partner, but there are a lot of investors who want to see a team of two. And you should just be aware of that. And if you're developing a product like Jada is, because she's not a software engineer, she, she should be finding a technical co-founder who wants to go on this journey with her and is ready to make quick changes in the software to supply the customers with what they want. Okay, so no more than three bullet points per person, especially for a live presentation. You can use logos from your past companies, especially if they're banner companies. And if you don't have a lot of work experience, but you went to a great school, you can include those logos as well. Those things are still respected, even if it doesn't mean that you went and got the best education you could. That, that sounded weird. Okay, so the Ivy Leagues are always going to be respected, even if you went to, um, let's say, MIT, which is not an Ivy League school, and you got an engineering degree, then, then they know you're worth your salt. Or there are a lot of schools that people like you and me may not know, like the South Dakota School of Mines is an excellent school. It produces excellent engineers. Investors know that. They know that Santa Clara University produces excellent engineers. So it depends on what your company is. If they invest in that industry, they will know the good schools, even if 
Joe on the street has never heard of it. So you can go ahead and put your logos in for your good schools. All right, so this was a, a not great uh, example of the team. The team here was one person, and she was trying to kind of co-opt the experience of these developers that she was contracting with and including the business model at the same time. So let's keep the team and the business model separate. One idea per slide, right? All right, here was a group. Um, I think these guys were brother and sister. They just didn't want to tell us, so they didn't put their last names in, even though I asked them to. And there's nothing wrong with starting a company with a SID. There's nothing wrong with it. You should just be out there with it, especially when they bring different skills to the party. Um, and I asked them to fix this, and they didn't do it. Um, there's too many words here under both of them. There's no logos, there's no bullet points, and it's written in kind of a conversational tone, but it should really just be bullet points for a live presentation. And you should know that all the decks that I get, we tell them this is for a live 10-minute presentation. Please make it adjusted to that fact, and we give them four different assets that they can look at that tell them this, but they don't. Um, so I really liked this team side. These two guys, the company is based in Las Vegas. Um, Ellie is in Illinois. It's a nice, friendly looking picture. They tell us about what they've done. And this, definitely not a doctor, right? Um, <laughs> this guy has a PhD, so he's a doctor. Um, they made snooze. They still make snooze. It's a sound machine for going to sleep, and they gain traction in Las Vegas by getting into several hotels. Yeah. So it's just, to me, this is one of the nicest, friendliest um, team slides. I was no waiting problem. for the next one. Oh, you're waiting for the next one. Oh, because you can see what was coming. I can see what's next. coming. Okay, I was waiting for him to take a picture of <laughs> doing it. All right, so the ask. So this, your ask, every deck should have an ask. Even if you're not ready for investment, if you are pitching the customers, the ask is tell your friends and buy this stuff. If you're pitching to mentors, the ask can be help me. Help me with introductions to technical people. Help me with introductions to investors. Help me. So you should always have an ask, even if it's not a monetary ask. If it is a monetary ask, then you want to know the people that you're talking to, whether they invest in your industry or if they don't. And if they don't, then sometimes just getting to pitch at a certain investment company is cool. And you can use that to leverage to get into other investor groups. Okay, when you are pitching to non-accredited investors, if you're going to an angel group or you're going to a VC fund, they're all assumed to be accredited investors. So you can be very specific in your ask with your valuation, how much, what they're getting for it. If you're doing a pitch competition where you're going to win a prize just for the quality of your pitch and you're not actually seeking investment, you should understand whether that competition wants you to include the investor ask because if they do, you have to ask them more details. It's like, am I going to get in trouble? Because the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, specifies who you can make an actual offer to, a pitch to. And so when we do our pitch days, as we did today, we make a disclaimer in the beginning, say this pitch is for our investors. They are all accredited investors under this rule. But our educational focus means that we want to enable other founders, rising founders, and the community to understand what we're doing. And so this is not a pitch for them, but they get to hear it for the educational purpose. 
So you have to, especially as you get into later rounds, you have to be responsible for knowing who your audience is and whether they are accredited or not. All right, so when you're asking for money, you should specify what the vehicle is, whether it's a convertible note, a convertible note will have an amount, a term limit, and interest. Now, most investors that are doing a convertible note will actually not make you pay interest. They will just add it on at the end of the conversion, at the end of the note. If it's a, a safe, which is a simple agreement for future equity, we're getting into some technical terms here, um, but if it's a safe, you're going to have a valuation cap and you're going to have some other specific details in there that the investor will want to know. You should consult your attorney uh, when you're making the offer in your pitch as to what you can say. And you should also list the use of funds. So if you give me $250,000, I am spending 50% on this and I'm spending 10% on this and 15% on that. And you're just gonna go through what you're spending it on. Investors will ask you to elaborate if you do not get specific enough with what, what does marketing mean to you? Are you paying salaries to marketing people or are you spending it all on advertising and social media and actual marketing things? So they will ask about that. Um, I mentioned that if you um, have exited founders and you want to put your ask up front, you can do that. You might consider it. You don't have to spend a ton of time on this because investors will ask you about it. But if you don't have the vehicle, so whether it's a convertible note or straight equity, preferred stock, or a safe, if you don't have the vehicle on the side, they will ask about that. And then they will want to know some other details too. So here is an interesting ask slide with a big dollar sign implying that they want some money. The company is a unique concept that will have an impact on the Las Vegas community. Does this sound like a sales pitch? Not only in the uniqueness of the product that we will offer, but the humanitarian efforts we will initiate to help others less fortunate in the Las Vegas community. All right, down at the bottom, we're seeking $400,000. This will be to cover all expenses for initial startup. It's not enough information, and it doesn't speak at all about what sort of vehicle is. Is it a note? Is it preferred? What is it? So this is an example of somebody, when I would see this slide, I would say they have no idea what they're talking about. And I would worry for them. I worry for founders when they ask for money and they don't understand what they're getting into. This company needs 275,000. That's really easy to understand. I like that part of it. And they're going to take most of it for salaries. This is not a good risk for an investor. 20,000 for marketing, 5,000 for employee benefits, which is part of salary and then 5,000 for working capital, which could be part of salary. So we're almost at $255,000 for this funding round. And how is that going to move the needle? How is that going to make this company progress? So early, early investments, we're expecting the people that are working in the company to putting, be putting in sweat equity and not taking a standard salary. And that's life, folks. That's just what investors expect. And so we're talking about angel investors, really early stage. Um, your first round of funding may be friends and family. But here's my admonishment to you. If you take money from anybody, anybody, write it down. Uncle Joe gave me $20,000 on this day. What is he expecting in return? He doesn't know. Okay, But it, in the future, when you get to real investment rounds, they're going to want to know who gave you money and what is their expectation. And so when you get your first term sheet from an angel group, they may go back to Uncle Joe and say, these are the terms that the angels are willing to accept. Is it acceptable to you? Because now he may have some sort of conversion or he may understand more about where the company is and what its current valuation is. So 
please record every penny that is invested, even if a relative says it's a gift. Please record it. Um, this company was working on, woo! <laughs> Yeah, like yes. Um, so he was working on a system that was, it was during COVID. It was cleaning surfaces, cleaning the air, it was doing something around COVID. And so he wanted 300000 to start and continue to sell his device in Nevada and all 49 other states. So he got the number of states right, which is great because you ask 10 people on the street and they may not know. So that was good, um, but it doesn't tell us anything about what he's going to do with this money. There's no use of funds. There's no vehicle. Um, again, this was probably a first time founder and he didn't understand what he was supposed to do with this slide. So it would require more work on the slide. All right, this one's pretty specific, right? Seeking 500,000 for 12% equity or preferred stock, okay? That's clear. That is the vehicle, it's preferred stock, 12%, 500K, that imputes a value. I can't do the math right now, but it does give you a valuation for this company. And so as an investor, you're going to say, okay, what are their sales versus what is their implied value? Uh, the use in funds is on here, it's just not that easy to see. Can you see what is the 10% blue stuff versus the 30% blue stuff? Can you see from the legend what it is? No, it's rather difficult. Um, so this is not a great use of funds chart. It could be better, could be more understandable. This company wants to exit in five years. That's great. They're focused on an exit. That means that they want to give money back to their investors. So there's a lot of good things about this, but there are still things that could be improved about this ask slide. In fact, here's how I approved it. <laughs> I remade that slide, 500,000 for 12% equity or preferred stock. And then now we can understand what the use of funds is, even though it's kind of goofy in that I did the same colors as the pie sections, but it is still easier to understand than the last one. Question. Yes. How do you determine valuation for your company? How do you say 12% really is worth 500K? Well, that's open for negotiation, isn't it? So it depends on what your attraction is. Um, so trying to impute a value, that's why safes are great. This simple agreement for future equity, it, because you don't have to assign evaluation to your company. You're just going to cap it. Like you're the first company or first investors in, so we're going to valuation cap it at 5 million or 4 million. Okay? And then that way you get the discount at that point when you have actually a priced round. Okay? So you're saying it's future equity, but here's the cap cuz you came in early. We, have, we know we have a lower valuation at this time, we're gonna cap it at this, you get a 20% discount. So when this next event occurs, those are the kind of things that you get to monkey with. Your value, so we have a priced round at 10 million, but your cap was 5 million. Okay, so that's how you get to buy in at that valuation. All right. This one also gets remade because there's a lot of words on this slide. So they're looking for 600,000 and they want to accelerate their pipeline through sales and marketing. So they're trying to throw gas on the fire so that they can grow their sales faster. Right? They're going to spend 70% on marketing and they're going to spend 30% on content creation. So within their marketing though, they did say here that they're expanding their sales staff. So some of that money is going to salaries, um, but salespeople, but you would probe into that more. Okay, so your salespeople, what are you paying them at as a base? What is their incentive program for uh, their sales? So early stage, you want them to be having kind of a livable wage, but you want the incentive to be 
on the quota and getting there so that if they make their quota, they're making the money that they want to make. Because everybody benefits in that case. All right, so they also are looking for an exit strategy, which is great. And so they're going to go to a, an A, and then they want to sell the company in three to five years. Here is a remake of that. 600,000, they have circled 400K. So they have enough investors that also want to invest right now at 400K. They've got them on the line, about to reel them in. Their use of funds, and then the exit strategy, they would be talking about it because it's a live pitch. So this is what you want to leave on the slide that the investors can look at while they're asking questions. And then your last slide should be a thank you slide. Tam Samsung, no. What's the most important slide in the deck, Jada? Um, it's your contact slide. If you make a good impression, how are they going to get back in touch with you? They, it's like going on a date and not giving your phone number to the person you liked and had a good time with. So do not forget to put in the contact slide. And just as you guys have been taking pictures of some of the slides that I put up there, if they're interested in you, they will take a picture on your contact slide. Even if you went to pitch to somebody and you didn't know who you were pitching to, it was a pitch contest, people will be able to reach out to you and say, hey, I'm interested, or hey, I know somebody who's doing some, something. Yeah. something. Maybe you would like to talk to that person. Maybe. <laughs> now I can. Okay, so the contact slide. Now just to cover things again. For style, we want it to be a large font, an easy to read font. An easy to read font is a sans serif font. The serifs are the little tails on things that make them look fancy. So you can get rid of any serifs. You want minimal background elements. You want your text to stand out or your image, whatever it is that you want people to focus on. You want that to stand out. I don't think that page numbers are necessary. If you get into a second pitch where you're doing a more technical pitch, you're talking to other scientists or financial people, then you can put page numbers on there because experienced investors will write down the page number and say, can you go back to page this? With a very simple first deck, there's only seven or eight elements. So you can say, can you go back to the ask slide? They'll say, can you go back to your Tam Sam song? Can you back to your traction slide? And so it's easy enough to identify what you've talked about, but you don't really need the distraction of page numbers. You also don't need to have a whole page that says problem, and then the next slide has the problem. You just want to get to it, like be succinct. Um, the video, I already told you, it's going to fail when you want it to work the most. And you want to use really simple charts, not complex charts, until you get into deeper rounds where if you are doing financials, you want a more extensive chart. And then no more than two photos per slide. And so this is my last slide. It says, well, I say thank you, but it's got my contact information on it, so they can get in touch with me. You can include a phone number too, but if you do that, be prepared to answer your phone professionally at all times. If you do email, it's safer because you can see that at your leisure. Okay, questions, anybody? I have a suggestion for you along that phone number thing. Yeah. Because if you if you go to Google Voice, you get a Google Voice number. Yeah. And give that out. When it rings on your phone, you can have it show the Google Voice number so you know it's coming. Right. Exactly. You can do that. But that means that you still have to be looking at your phone before you answer it. Yep. <laughs> All right. So let's talk specifically about our presentations on Saturday. If you haven't signed up yet, I do encourage you to do so. Um, we've got specific times. Carl will add you to the, the list. And you guys should think about this as an opportunity to practice and to try to cover these things. If you don't know them, just do your best. Sorry, I can't mute people for some odd reason. 
Uh, this is the first time I'm hearing about a Saturday thing. Seriously? Yes. I think that there's a group of us that are not actually getting stuff from you guys. Because like the week you changed to Zoom, there were like eight of us that were standing out at the front. Oh, that's terrible. So, oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, that's OK. Yeah, I, just I tried to add them to our Slack, and for some odd reason, it's just not letting me. So, um, but you should, be, but the emails are going to everybody who registered. Yeah. Did we get it? All right. But so can um, you tell us about Saturday? So Saturday is our demo day. And so, um, could I tell you specifically? Well, I don't remember, how long are our pitches? Are they six minutes or eight minutes? They are not 10, I can assure you of that. Eight minute pitches, and then like five minutes of questions. That makes sense. So it's like 15 minutes per person because between switching, I, I can check. Um, I, I I know where to look it up. But you have a question from Gabrielle, which is, what is in ver convertible? Uh, you mentioned oh convertible note. Okay, so I mentioned a convertible note. So it has a specific term. Usually it's about two years. Usually there is an interest rate associated with it. And the, the company specifies these terms. Okay, so it could be a two year note at 8% interest, or it could be a two year note at 6% interest. But whatever terms you specify, you should be doing research to find out what is current for the time. Because times change. In so bizarre, like in 2021, everybody was investing. Like there was, there was free money everywhere. But what, what that did was it made the companies who are now in 2023 and they need another round of financing, their valuation was so inflated that a lot of them are... You're right there, come to the back. I don't know if he wanted, she told me, he just called me and... Okay, it's the same person over and over again who is unmuting. And I don't know how that's happening. Um, maybe they're hitting the space bar, but um, so what's happening is um, if they didn't take enough money back when money was really easy um, and they need a, a round now, they're hopefully they're staying the same because it's not a down round. The valuation is staying the same. Um, but if they, because the times have changed, if they have to go to a lower valuation, it's not good investors frown upon that. They want to see continual growth so that you're making more money so your valuation goes up with every round. Um, but there was so much free money in 2021 and 2022 that um, it's, it's going to bite some founders in the butt, unfortunately. But the convertible note. The convertible note converts into stock at a certain time and becomes part of equity. But if you haven't done an equity round, it just converts to something else. So it's it's like debt, um, but you usually don't pay it back. Like I said, the interest accrues and they just say, okay, now instead of having borrowed 200,000, you borrowed 260,000 or whatever. I can't do the math tonight, but <laughs> this is what you've borrowed, so that converts into whatever the next thing is. Um, it is an eight minute pitch and four minute QA. So, tw okay. So 12, 12 minutes total. 12 minutes total, but then there's transition time. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. yeah. Eight and then four, did you say? Okay, and if you guys are gonna sign up, please let me know because we have a special thing that's happening at the end and I need to know your names. Yes, it's really cool. That's why I'm trying, we're trying to make everybody sign up because it's really cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, and also, um, it's uh, a part of your course graduation as well. Um, so to successfully graduate um, and get the really cool thing, um, you have to do the pitch. Right. So. And so, but like I said, don't be nervous about it. There, there will be friendly investors who are not actually likely to invest but there will be those types in the room as well as all of us who have been supporting you and encouraging you and hoping that you guys have success you guys will do great i promise it's going to be wonderful i might cry don't give me eight minutes and it wasn't like last night where it was like a one minute and then a three minute and you're like 
Well, so, so <laughs> Michelle is also doing Angel Envy. And so Angel Envy is a different sort of program. And so we focus on the, the one minute yeah. and then the three minutes. So usually there's voting between the one minute and the three minute. And so only the people who are really confident have slides for the three minute pitch. In a one minute pitch, you don't have time for slides. Mm -hmm. So you just have to be able to talk about your product. And you, you cover fewer things, like not all the seven things that we covered tonight. You want to cover the problem and solution. You probably want to tie it into a story about why you started the company. And then like the other point can be, this is a huge market and we're really excited about it. And in the one minute pitch, you just want the person you're talking to to say, tell me more. I mean, the one minute pitch is what you would do at a party. So this is what I, what do you do? Well, this is what I do. Let me tell you, you know, and it's one minute. It's really succinct. And then you hope that they say, that's interesting. Tell me more. And then you can do like a three minute thing. This is a way not to annoy people at parties, <laughs> but so, they also talk about what you do. You do have some questions online. Okay. Uh, first question is from David. My biggest concern is not knowing cost for manufacturing, but I labeled a lot of projections as pending estimate. Okay, so you're just early in the process, David, and but you know that you need to get this information, right? And I'm sure you're working toward it. So go with what you have. This is just pitch practice. So if you have some estimates from what you've been able to find, and if you're actually like planning to manufacture something and you've written to contract manufacturers, then they are slow to get back to you. Uh, but the thing too that you may find, David, as you progress is that in the, the first thing they say, okay, for me to do under a thousand pieces, it's going to cost this much. But once you get to 10,000 pieces, it's going to go down. And once you get to a higher number of pieces, it's going to go down even more. So you can know that your first costs of goods sold are going to be higher than when you get to scale. And so that gives you more room when you get to scale to do specials and promotions and things like that. But when you're starting out, you still need to cover your costs with the price that you set based on this low number of manufacturing that you can order in the early part of your business. And then, Gabrielle, was CAC LTV interaction an, interaction an example? Uh, we can go back to that slide. Um, yeah, that was an example of the gal who had the, um, her company is called Panty Drop. And then it's uh, pantydrop.me is her website. And so she had, um, she had sales. So she was able to do both, um, are you guys, no, you don't see the crap that's on the screen. All right. So she was able to, you can see she was in business from 2018 and she's still in business now. So she had several quarters there where she could actually do analysis. She was an MIT engineer, so she had no trouble doing these analyses on what her churn was and what her retention was and what the cost to acquire a customer was. And each quarter she reported what that was because it doesn't stay the same. Cost to acquire a customer will change depending on how much you're spending on advertising and whether you have retention. So um, I don't know if that answers your question, Gabrielle. Gabrielle, if you want to mute yourself, feel free. Do, do I need to promote her or anything? No, I think they can go ahead and unmute. Okay. Tell your dad um, happy 80th birthday, Mike. <laughs> um, and uh, so he said he'll try to make it uh, for a few hours on Saturday, but his dad's 80th birthday is. Oh, is that okay? Um, so we're starting at noon. We've allowed five hours. Um, so if you need to go at a specific time that will sort of accommodate your 80th birthday party for dad, let us know. Okay, I, I, yeah, I just, I, I want to do it, but I just, <laughs> it, <clears throat> there's like 40 people coming to town, and I just, I don't know that, you know, it's an all, all weekend event where people are, oh, okay. you know, and I was sad when I signed up because I knew 
exactly what was going to happen. So. Okay, is this David? Uh, it's Mike. Mike. No, this is Mike, Mike talking. Okay, um, Mike, here's what you can do. You can record your pitch. So make it an eight minute pitch and just record it. So if you have a Zoom, you can, you can join a Zoom by yourself and record yourself. You may have other ways of recording too if you have Apple and, and other products. But okay. do that and send it to us and you can send it on Saturday morning, as late as Saturday morning, and then you'll be able to graduate. Okay, I will, uh, I will figure that out. Okay, and that's open to everybody too. Um, it's, it's a little bit of a cheat to not be in front of people because still among the population, speaking in front of other people is stressful and they try to avoid it. So recording is much easier because you're just looking at a camera. But um, if that's the only way that we have and you want to do your pitch, you can do it that way. But we encourage you to be here and have the yummy food that we're going to have. Oh, no. Oh, wait, 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 what? Huh? <laughs> maybe, maybe Ricky's bringing some of that uh, Kirkland vodka. I don't know. Tell her about the Kirkland vodka. It's changed the entire semester. It definitely has. I was like, is it close to? It will be on Saturday. All right, any other questions in the room or online? Are these slides going to be available? Oh, yes. So you would, uh, yes, we can send them out. Yep. Um, do, I have terrible luck putting links to things in Slack and then actually retrieving them. I would rather just email them. I think um, Cara's been doing it, but. Um, you can pen them for each one. I'm sorry? Pens in Slack. Yeah. So if there's like specific, uh, like the sign up. So if it's pinned to a channel, and then it like stays at the top. Oh. So like even for like okay, so things in like Zoom so pin or got that pin the sign up sheet right as soon as we can, and but I will still email out today's slide deck. Um, and we're recording this, so you guys get the recordings. It takes a few days for us to edit it, and you've got kind of a tight timeline for Saturday. Um, but I will send this deck out tonight. Okay. So the slides we use for our, our presentation, if, are those, is that the PowerPoint? Do we use PowerPoint or is there a certain? So you can create your slides the way that you want to. You can bring them on a thumb drive and we'll play them for the pitch. So you can do, you can save them as a PDF, an Adobe file. You can make them in Canva. The, you can do it in PowerPoint, save it as a PDF, either one of those. Um, there are tons of templates online. So if you were just to search online and say, pitch deck template, it may have more slides than what we need. So you should be feel free to edit them. A lot of them are too busy. Like, I, you know, I like them really sort of plain so that what you're saying is emphasized and not the, the fancy background. Um, and they'll have page numbers usually. Like the, the basic templates in PowerPoint have three different pieces of information on the bottom, like the date and the name of it and some other thing, the page number, like that stuff's not necessary. Don't, don't feel stressed about that kind of stuff. What you should be working on is telling your story and covering these topics if you can. Can we email you a copy of our slides for notes or would that be better to get in real time? David, unfortunately, it's startup week. And I'm up and working at six. And then I get in a cab to come here, although thankfully tomorrow we're here. So it's mm -hmm. gonna be much easier. I can walk to the hotel, take an Uber. Um, and so we'll be here for mentorship tomorrow. So if you do have questions, bring them tomorrow for mentorship and we'll give feedback for all of you. Okay, so we can do a little pitch yeah. deck workshop tomorrow. Yeah, That's and we'll, we'll have Ken. We'll have other people, too, here. Are you coming tomorrow? I'll be here tomorrow. Well, 
She'll let us know. <laughs> well, because I have to be at a, for a little bit. Cause oh, yeah, to because, to... so Rikshana, so during Startup Week, tomorrow is a really fun event called Ignite, and these are little bite-sized TED Talks that happen in five minutes, and they're not supposed to be about your business. They're supposed to be about something about which you're passionate or you want to make a point, but not talking about your business. And they that will be down the street yep. at Millennium Fandom, and Rikshana is our hostess for, for the night. So she has to be there before, before we finish um, our workshop yeah. tomorrow. But Ken so, and I will definitely be here tomorrow. So I'll probably start here and then head over there. Um, yeah, is okay. The plan. Um, but I thought it would be a lot easier. You remember how I was like, oh my God, I'm going to need to practice. Yeah, it's not as easy as I thought. It is not as easy. So this is 20 slides. They advance every 15, 15 seconds. seconds. Mm -hmm. And so as long as you're telling a story and it's kind of keeping up with your slides, it's fine. But if you get behind, it's really easy to get flustered. Yeah. yeah. But it's a fun event. So I'm And I, I have to rehearse. Time. I'm doing one, too. I have to rehearse. Well, we keep <coughs> shouting out the times, and I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> 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 this isn't your being. This is overly aggressive. It's not helping me. So I can just try to tell you what time you're at, and it just derails quickly. <laughs> He's not a good practice partner. Maybe he is better than you think he is. It's causing me anxiety. Okay. <laughs> All right, so David, in answer yeah, to your question, <laughs> um, if you email me your slides, I probably will not get to them until we're actually in the mentorship session tomorrow night. So. Any other questions from anybody online? Yes, Lawrence. Yeah, so um, I. Where I was actually attending the uh, uh, class today earlier. So. Yeah, it was Tam Sam's on today. Yeah, so um, unfortunately, I made it extremely late because I went to the wrong location. <laughs> yes, I'm However, sorry about that. No, that's okay. It's not your fault, it's mine because I should have asked um, specifically which location it came to. However, um, the information you covered in the class today, was it the same information that you have in the YouTube video? Because I, I did review that as well. So I added more information at uh, one of our employees' requests on SAW and how do you get to it and how would you think about it. So that whole table where we said, okay, this is our business. Um, I made a business where we're serving two different kinds of cuisine. We're doing it in um, not quite a ghost kitchen, but it, we don't have retail restaurant. We're just cooking and making delivery with two different types of cuisine, um, Italian and Chinese. And so we know that we have a market where there is a university and kind of a small town, not a huge town. Like Las Vegas, it's too big and too spread out for one kitchen to serve it. So we know that our ideal place to be is a smaller community where we're located relatively close to a campus and that there is other populations surrounding it. So we looked at our, to create some for five years, we said, okay, after two years, we would be able to expand into a second market. So we have to do research on our potential second and third markets in order to get to some for five years. So we did an analysis of the population base of various schools, and we did an analysis of what it costs to advertise in those markets. What we do know is that we have to have a kitchen, so we also need to consider rents for kitchens, for the equipment, for labor to do the cooking, so all those kinds of things that you need to analyze before you actually would open a second market. You need to do the research now to get to some for it to be defensible. But when you actually are in business and it is time to open your second market, you're going to have to do it all again. But you're going to have a better idea of what your top five picks are for your second market. So we, the table in that uh, Video. Well, the table in the thing that I did today has 12 different cities that have schools, and it analyzed the population and the advertising cost so that we could find out 
where our likely next markets might be. And so the, the slide I showed, do you remember it? It had like yellow and it had green. The green were the nice combination of population and advertising cost. So those were our primary targets for a second or third market. So I only added this recently, but if you look at Angel and V, so if you go to our YouTube channel and you look at Angel and V playlist and the Tam Sam Som video, that will include the new information that I added for that class first and did again today. Is it too late to reach out to Patrick? No. So Lawrence asked if it was too late to reach out to Patrick for research for this Saturday. And it's not too late to reach out. Even if you don't get the information to include by Saturday, it will be good to have the information. And so I don't know what's going on at UNLV this week. I don't know if he's on vacation or if he's like, wrapped up doing finals work for other people, but go ahead and reach out. I, I, um, I'm really, I'm a little glad that I got to this point, but I'm a little disappointed because it's now. <laughs> it's <laughs> now, but so, this is a process. Yeah, Be I forgiving of yourself. And my big grandiose idea now has just been whittled down to a smaller scale where I are now, it seems like something I need to take it to start and more likely to get an investor in the capital or whatever to start it. And then I can go to the idea that we were talking about earlier. But yeah. to start off at the idea that I was talking about earlier, after a while I was like, oh, this is going to be interesting. And I don't know if I'm going to confidently get the funding to do this as a big scale thing. Yeah. So when you explain that, it's probably much more. You do, but you're going to be better off for it. So Lawrence, Lawrence had a, a more complicated idea. And I said, well, you, you don't have to do that. You've got a product. The coffee cheesecake was a big hit with the staff. <laughs> and so, so work on that. Focus on that. And then when you gain some traction with that, then you can work on the other idea. Then you've got two revenue streams, but you want to focus on the thing where you're going to make money the fastest. Yes, sir. Because um, I feel like I'm somewhat in the same boat when it comes to sharing my story and problem and bringing it down because I do have like this bigger idea. However, like I understand my opinion of this bigger idea that it has to be a foundation kind of set first, like the MVP, to add additional features and focus on different groups within this market um, to expand to. So with this pitch deck, is, is there like a balance potentially that, that's possible to where it's, hey, this is what I'm truly wanting to go after, but right now, and I know we're kind of like telling the investment, hey, phase one is, X, Y, Z, and then we hope to get to here, 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 if the market, we're hypothesizing is this, and we're hoping the market tells us the direction. Right, so you may have heard of a minimum viable product. Yeah. All right, you may have also heard the adage, launch early, launch often. Get your product together and put it out there. It doesn't have to be perfect. If you have people who are willing to buy when it's not perfect, then you start talking to your customers, you can perfect it. And you can get to that area where you want to be. So what your final vision is. But if you don't start, you'll never get there. Yeah. That, you have two where, products, though, in a way, right? Like, um, it's, you, have your, you have that coaching, online coaching. Was that you? Yeah, so to me, in the past, I used to like describe it as my end, the end goal is to be more of a LinkedIn of sports, right? Because yeah. they're very similar when it comes to how one works up to get to what they want to be at some point. And 
with this whole ecosystem, there's all these different problems and there's solutions towards them. However, for me being a data guy, like I'm thinking, and this is what I've realized when I was a coach, that there's all this different information and data, however, none of these platforms are communicating and working with one another to make the data as valuable as it could be, where each user of businesses are able to gain value with it. Um, so, so, so what kind of coaching I, is it? Not just sports coaching it's, or yeah. athletic training. Well, so that's where, so when I think, when you talk about the sports ecosystem, there is athletes, there's you know trainers, instructors, and there's teams, right? Each one of these groups, and you work with one another in order to like survive, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. Sports is not a thing without any of this stuff. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. there, my eyes, and there still hasn't been a platform built to let these different groups really coincide. There's no synergy with them all, and with no synergy, then that limits the potential growth for each of these different groups, pretty much. So for me, that's where the complication is, um, especially trying to uh, send, share this thing. It's hey, when I talk about in school, it's like we're talking like in the sports aspect. There's video analysis, there's data, video. There's team and group management. There's recruitment. There's uh, there's scheduling too. Well, the scheduling actually yes, that's a part of this phase one, but the scheduling. Um, there's, there's so much that there's all these different data. So what what is the thing that causes the most pain for the people who are involved in it? Yes, yeah, so the way I'm thinking is the related, which relationship is strongest between these three different groups. And for me, when I look at it, um, I think it's the athlete and trainer relationship because it's the most consistent and it's the longest relationship out there in this whole sports life cycle. Okay. So I'm focusing on phase one. What are two problems that these two different groups are having, kind of individually, but also collectively when it comes to working together? So providing a solution for that. So when I've been, like today, for instance, like during work, I'm practicing these pitches, but I can't. I'm trying to condense it down as much as possible. I'm still stuck at 12 minutes. Oh wow! And uh, <laughs> like, and I know there's certain things I can do, and I'm glad that I was able to do because in the past, when I submitted a pitch and I got the feedback, it, I did I I originally set up my pitch deck as the live presentation. Ah. And then I when I got the feedback back, um, because it was just you know individuals reading the slides. Right, it's like so. What's you know? It wasn't hard. It was hard to communicate what I'm trying to go for. Uh, yes, so because now like there is a lot of interpolation. When you have a, a deck that's really simple, you're yeah. relying on the script. So it, you can include the script with the deck if you put it in speakers' notes. Yeah. So they understand what you're going to talk about with each slide. Yeah, so that's what I'm realizing. Pitch check that. Made or revised is that right now I have it built for just a submission for someone to look at it online. Okay. And now I have to like. Break yep, it they down. are different. Pitch decks, you should have a library. Yeah. A library of different lengths and different purposes. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. So, yeah, I got a little tweak this one. But that's where, you know, I mean, it's the problem of. Yeah. How do I tell the story of, hey, I'm, I want to go for all of this, but right now is I'm focusing on phase one. Because yeah. moving at phase one, it's hard to sell that. So when, you, when you talk about your business model, yeah. a little bit about the customer, but the business model, this is the first market we're going after because this is where the, the true pain point is. This is what we're going to serve us uh, charge. This is who our customer is. We see our next revenue streams as being, and you only give it a sentence or two. Yeah. Our next revenue streams are dealing with this issue and this issue. They're all related, but the first pain point that we're going to solve is this one. Okay. Yeah, but you, you don't want to take away from the focus of what you're actually working on right now. 
Yeah, yeah, and that's where I'm, the way I kind of designed it was I kind of did the problem in like a two slide high level is what we're going after, big picture, and then here's the here's phase one and here's why, and here's the problems people are running into. Okay. Yeah, I don't like to see more than two slides on the problem. Yeah. Because <laughs> when you have two slides on the problem, it's like you're trying to boil the ocean and you don't have enough focus. So you need to show that you are focused on solving the most painful thing. Yeah. The most painful thing you can charge more for. The less painful things are like adults. Right. You charge. Yeah. And if you want to also, you know, stir your soup with your vacuum cleaner, it costs this much more. Yeah. Yeah, but your the vacuum cleaner is getting rid of dirt. You know, so focus on what you're focused on. Uh, there's one more question online. Uh, it is from Gabrielle. Uh, how do you find the similarly in competition analysis? How do you find out who your competitors are? Is that the question? I think so. Uh, this, I think so. so when you're doing the market research with Patrick or doing it on your own, it's very easy. That you're in the same industry. It's very easy to find out who your competitors are. What is harder is if you're developing a software application, it's harder to find out who's doing the same thing you are doing because the categories are so broad in software that it's hard to find out who else is working on it. And if they're developing something new, like you are, you may not know about it. There may be another founder in Buffalo and another one in North Dakota and another one in Arkansas that's working on the same problem. And it's really hard to know that. It's hard to find that out. Okay. Um, thanks, everybody, for joining today. Um, and again, thank you. Uh, I think everybody's taking away a lot from today. Um, don't be afraid to pitch. It's, it's going to be great. You guys will do great. I promise, I promise, I promise. It's a safe space. I will bring the Kirkland. <laughs> um, if anybody you guys will have to like sneak into this room, do some shots, and then go pitch. <laughs> the courage juice, you know. Don't bring tomatoes. Huh? Don't bring tomatoes. No throwing of tomatoes. No or tomatoes. Eggs. <laughs> no promise. I, pro I promise. I'll throw candies. Yes, Lawrence. Bring your family. No, that's, that's not the question? question. Okay. But you're welcome to do that. Right. So we are good friends. Uh -huh. He is the owner of a really well known magazine out there. And every once in a while, he would do events and invite me to come to the group of kids that might be a cheesecake bar. So I kind of looked at it as a marketing strategy or a marketing channel, so to speak, to do events and basically promote the product fair because, you know, we have to do a pro bono just to basically advertise. Right. Um, can I list him as a team member with regards to, like, networking or some sort of partner relations or anything like that, or do I just keep it at what it is right now? I wouldn't consider him a team member. Okay. So Lawrence asked about somebody who has a good relationship with who will often invite him to um, display and offer his yummy treats uh, at an event, which gives him exposure. So he's asking, could that by person be considered a marketing partner? Um, not an advisor, but a marketing partner. You might do that. Um, they're really just a fan, a fan because He's gaining more from your, like you're gaining exposure, but he's also gaining free cheesecake. You know, it's it's kind of a business relationship. I think it'd be cute if you added your kid as the taste tester. 
<laughs> or your product tester in that deck at the end. No, too much. Is no, is your is your child a a product tester? He's quality. He's call him quality control. Quality he's a team control. member. A little picture up. He's a team member. He's got a picture of quality <laughs> control. You know what? He would love that. Yeah. <laughs> in fact, you might you might be familiar with who he is. His name is Jordan. Jordan. Tiny, tiny. I'm he's I'm not from Las Vegas. He's, well, he's received emails from you because he said, "Are you? Do you know who Maggie Sealy is?" I'm like, "Yeah, actually, I do." So basically, I was given advice to put him on a mail list. Oh, he has oh. his own little thing. Does he? Yeah, tiny, tiny magnets and more. Oh. He sells his paintings on fridge magnets, and he's moving up to the giving team. How old is he? Oh, that's fantastic. He's twelve now. Oh, oh my that's so cute. So oh, that's, I love that's part that. of the struggle because I'm doing this and I'm helping him. You're supporting him. Too, so, so you're on his team. He's on your team, though. Yeah. 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 You're on each other's team. Yeah. yeah. So um, we have to sort out his monthly uh, kidspreneur events that he did with the kid, uh, his kids' own. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, his mom asked me Staring to right at slow it down, <laughs> get him going into, the, like, get him on the right track in school, and then in January we can restart him again because. School is kind of an issue right now, so yeah. Um, you know, it's tough with a high IQ kid. He's like really smart, but then he's easily bored. Yeah. Like, oh gosh. <laughs> <laughs> However, um, I, I, that's what I was asking if I could add, you know, my remark to that. But that's a good idea to taste this because he loves it. Yeah, I like I like him for quality control. And the Valentine's Eve. Yeah, do do yeah, like makes it quality. Give him an official title, quality control. <laughs> <laughs> not not at night. That's breakfast. I four sons. I love them too. <laughs> you can add me as the dietitian. <laughs> All right. Um, so, Shani, did you put? Is that the uh, sign-up sheet? Yes. Yes. Okay. And thank you, David. Okay, so I hope to see you tomorrow night. We can go into different decks and see what we can do to fix things. If you come tomorrow um, to move things along, depending on how many people we have, then um, just show us the slides that you're worried about. Unless we do have not too many people and we have enough mentors where we could go through each deck and help you with the overall deck. <laughs>